employers, uh, when you go in, they tell you right away, this is not a union place. And we don't want unions here. And if there's no union, I mean, the boss would say, this is it, and that's it. You have no argue. You're there alone. I mean, uh, union, it's togetherness. And if you go, if you want something done, if you go alone, would they, they wouldn't even listen to you. But if you go as a group, I think, uh, as uh, representing the whole body, I think they will hear. But for the working and a poor man, that's the answer. Uh -huh. And I've experienced that. At my age, I know that it's, it's the answer to a poor man. But we learned that being united is power. Regardless, it is power. Uh, a single person cannot do anything. Alone, we cannot do anything. People are power. We take a look at the working conditions of women in Texas from World War II through the 50s and their struggles to improve their conditions tonight on Alternative Views. Last week on Alternative Views, we saw the first of a two-part series featuring the movie Talking Union, which was about the struggles of women workers in Texas before World War II. Well, tonight we're going to see the second half of the movie during World War II and afterward. What are the working conditions like of women at the time? And what happened when they struggled to try to improve their situation? After the movie, we'll talk to Patricia Silva, who is very active in the union organizing movement. She's an organizer with District 65 of United Auto Workers, as well as regional vice president of National Organization of Legal Services Workers. We'll talk to her about relationship with women and the workplace today and their efforts to organize in our so-called modern world. Our program on Talking Union was produced in September of 1982. Now here are some news stories from April of 86. Ever so often we have stories on alternative views which show you how when big corporations or even medium-sized corporations, but particularly big corporations, when they're caught uh, stealing or doing something illegal, well, they're, they might get fined a little bit, but uh, they still make money off the deal. But nobody in the company ever goes to jail or is really hurt much. A couple of stories from the Dallas Times Herald shows that things are still happening. In Garland, Texas, city officials released a list of 10 corporations that have been breaking the law there, industrial waste law, by dumping excessive concentrations of metal and chemicals into the public wastewater system. I mean, these are some pretty terrible things like cyanide, methyl ethyl ketone, and ethyl benzene. Now, they listed the names of the companies. And you know how the big corporations say, well, we're good corporate citizens. It's just those smaller and medium-sized countries that do the bad things. Well, let's see. There are those small companies like Sherwin-Williams, Union Carbide, Safeway, and Kraft, among others. But what's going to happen to these, comp uh, these companies for doing this? No fines have been assessed, but the city says that the companies have to take remedial action. <laughs> you better be good, boys. That's right. <laughs> But it was a little bit tougher on Rockwell because they had to come up with a $1 million fine to pay. It's the second largest military supplier, and they agreed to pay this because what happened, they'd, they'd been overcharging the government uh, for 
uh, defense contract work by falsifying uh, time cards of some of the uh, employees. And this brought up a Justice Department uh, statement that almost half of the nation's 100 defense contractors are under criminal investigation for fraud right now. But what are they doing about it? Is Rockwell, uh, some of those guys going to jail? The Justice Department uh, re uh, in Washington rejected Dallas federal prosecutors' recommendations to seek indictments for fraud against at least five Rockwell officials. So, no. they piddling million. Speaking of uh, waste and, uh, and th this sort of thing, this was an article out of the Round Rock Leader, which is just north of Austin. It was reprinted from the Indianapolis Star. So this is a well-traveled little piece. And they say just that General Dynamics Corporation has been indicted on charges of illegally billing the Department of Defense for $7.5 million in cost overruns on the DIVAD anti-aircraft gun, a project that was scratched after the Department of Defense had blown $1.8 billion on it. And they say, what taxpayers might like to see is an accounting of the $1.8 billion. Exactly who spent it? Exactly who got it? Why did it take so long to realize that the gun was a flop? The taxpayers footed the bill. Explanations are in order. They might help keep this kind of hyper-foolishness from happening again. I think this is just kind of indicative of the mood in the country. There was another uh, small article in the Bastrop Times, which is another small town near Austin. And they're also uh, harping on this uh, fiscal conservative kick. Uh, in this case, County Extension Air Agent Clara Maynard sent along an AP article showing that while the better part of the federal government would be whittled to a nub by Mr. Reagan's proposed budget, the White House, White House staff won't be joining in the cost-cutting fund. Nancy and Ron will have an extra $500,000 for a total of almost $5 million to spruce up the White House. Salaries for White House employees and their expenses are also on the way up. Similarly, the Office of Management and Budget, that's the agency in charge of paring down our national debt, wrote itself in for a $2.4 million raise. Uh, the natives, so it would seem, are restless usually think of bankers as the pillars of society and the guarantors of everything which is moral and ethical. Well, is that really true? I've hauled out my bank file to uh, share with you over the period of, of a couple of years or so. Pretty, pretty interesting things here. For instance, you may have heard about Jack Butcher, who was a financier in Tennessee. Well, he stole several millions of dollars from his banks, and they gave him a sentence not to exceed 20 years. Well, that's pretty bad, 20 years, except by, uh, that uh, he could have gotten 501 years by, uh, by all rights from what he did. And then down in Florida, you remember, there was a big scam down in Fort Lauderdale in government securities, which wiped out a lot of people, and leading a former uh, securities and exchange uh, man to say, sometimes I think someone tilted the United States and all the con artists slithered down, the slid down to the lower east coast of Florida. <laughs> of course, uh, Texas isn't immune to this, if you read the Texas Observer over the years, and even just recently in the Austin American Statement, it talked about former Governor John Conley, Big John, who co-signed and guaranteed a $4 million loan to one of his buddies, uh, with whom he's in business, as $4 million was supposed to go to buy a house and refurbish a house in Houston, but that, along with uh, $37.7 million and other loans, are non-operative now. Well, does this mean that there's bad stuff going on or just uh, people not doing too well or not very smart? Well, there's an article on First Chicago Corporation in the Wall Street Journal and said that the chief executive officer, who's of the First Chicago Corporation Bank, um, even though he's not doing too well, he said that there, he probably won't be replaced because the president, the number two man, has been passed over twice for the chief executive job, and the banking industry at large is short on available talent. So they don't have any, <laughs> as bad as the guy is, they can't find anybody to replace it. But it's really more sinister than that, it gets into I mean, the biggies and the big dealings when you start talking about the mob and dope and laundering of money. There have been investigations by the federal government as to a lot of laundering of money 
on drug accounts by some of America's biggest banks, for instance, the Irving Trust Company, Morgan Guarantee Trust, Chemical Bank, Marine Midland Bank, Bankers Trust, Bank America, uh, First Chicago that we were talking about a while ago. These uh, banks have been involved in doing this, according to uh, government uh, investigators. See, there's supposed to be government regulations to uh, keep a track on this because they're supposed to report, the banks are supposed to report uh, big trash, 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 <laughs> big cash transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, but they find the California bank, uh, Crocker, 2.25 million, and it was the sixth bank to be penalized back in 1985 at that time, up in August. Uh, and Crocker had been used by drug dealers from Mexico, according to the government, and the Far East as a conduit for concealing uh, drug uh, remedies. And uh, the penalty could have been higher. This is the old catch again. You can, you can do it and find a little bit, but uh, you made a lot of money off of it. We'll just keep quiet about it. But he said that the penalty could have been higher, as much as $7.8 million, but uh, Crocker's financial condition wasn't very good, and so they weren't going to fine him. But there are other of the big banks, too, that have been involved in the same thing. First National, Boston, Chase Manhattan, Manufacturers Hanover Trust. Uh, Houston a Bank got caught in the same web. $1.9 million was what they uh, penalized them. But I saw an article, I th think it was the Wall Street Journal, where somebody said, oh, they're finding these banks, you know, maybe you know, a couple million dollars or something like that, but they're making millions, they're making billions out of this. So that's like a mosquito, you know, biting an elephant's butt. The elephant ain't gonna care much about him, even if it feels it. So these things are happening with all the big, with all of these big banks, and uh, which shows that the big banks are just part of the drug and underworld system. I have a kind of a funny story that's from the current issue of Mother Jones magazine, and this is for all you health nuts out there. You know that bottled water costs a thousand times as much as tap water. And, and they say, of course, this means that it's a thousand times as good for you as tap water. Not so. As a matter of fact, some private citizens in California have found some rather strange things in their bottled water as of late. For instance, arsenic, hair, insect larvae and chewing gum and these Californians went and complained to their state about it and so the state started examining some of the bottled water that comes out of California and they found a few more interesting things such as nitrates, chloroform, toluene and benzene which is a known carcinogen of course. Now three of these popular brands of mineral, mineral water from California specifically Calistoga, Asante and Napa Valley also contain high levels of fluoride, which can cause uh, a whole bunch of different health problems, including skeletal deformities and streaking of teeth. Alambra bottled water, which is also a major uh, seller out in California, drew the attention of the state investigators because their well is located 4,000 feet from two underground chemical contamination sites. And these investigators also discovered that some of these companies were falsifying records doctoring water samples, and they didn't keep records of tests for chemical and radiological contamination. Now you may say, well, who cares what happens to Californians? Let them all be poisoned to death. But the thing is that... Wait a minute here. I uh, <laughs> read that article about a week ago, and I went out to my refrigerator and saw that I'd bought Asante mineral water here in Texas at uh, Wheatsville Co-op. Exactly. And it's circulating all over the uh, country. All over Austin, you'll find it. As a matter of fact, 40% of the bottled water in this country comes from California, mm. of course. And as a matter of fact, one of every 17 American has stopped drinking tap water and drinks this special water. There are three different types of, of uh, waters. Now, my nutritionist recommends distilled water. Distilled water, right, which is supposedly free of everything. Now, this, the, the mineral water, which is what they're talking about, right. this also includes mineral water along with the big gallon or five-gallon drum-sized things that you get at the health food store. Mm -hmm. It's a $1 billion industry uh, in the, this country and expected to double by 1990 because so many new people are taken by the, the properties of this great water. The problem is that the federal standards for bottled water are adopted from EPA drinking water standards, so they're no stricter than those for tap water. <sighs> Bottled water companies are not required to label the source of their product, 25% of which is just filtered tap water anyway. And what's worse, bottled mineral water is, is exempt from any federal reg regulation. 
Now there's been, there is some testing. They, they do a bacteria analysis every week. Chemical tests must be conducted annually. And radiological tests are done every four years. But a lot of the critics say, well, this isn't enough. And they say, also say that even if your brand meets federal standards, it could still be contaminated because the EPA requires monitoring only for a handful of these potentially harmful pollutants. And in place of the federal standards, several of the states have started enacting tougher uh, standards. Uh, Florida and New Jersey in specific and 12 other states have uh, enacted laws. But these t tougher state standards are still a far cry, the article says, from those that are in place in Europe where bottled water has been the primary source of drinking water for decades. The article says there, monitoring for bacteria, sodium, and carbonation levels is performed daily and sometimes hourly. And according to William Deal, who's with the International Bottled Water Association, you can't even begin to compare European water with ours, he says, because we make no health claims here. The funny thing is Deal also says that consumers in the United States are being fooled. He says, quote, People are buying bottled water as a preferred product. They assume it to be higher quality drinking water, and that's just not true. That's all the news for now. Now let's go back to September of 1982 and see the second half of our documentary, Talkin' Union. As men left to fight World War II, many women moved into heavy industry. In Dallas, white women garment workers created a labor shortage when they left to replace men in the aircraft plants. For the first time, black women were trained for the skilled positions of sewing machine operators. Well, get on board, get on board. How was it that the black local got established? Uh, well, it, it made this difference that many of the people who were making such low wages, even then, uh, left and went into the uh, airplane factories and things. So that meant uh, they were, they had to compete with that. So uh, it was, there was a shortage of, of people to work in the shops because of the aircraft that opened up. So then they, uh, that's when they opened the colored shop. They had a time organizing here in Dallas, so, oh, see, I came in on the, the good part of it. Uh, Nardis opened up, that used to be a sewing room. I don't know whether you know anything about that or not, but the government uh, would have hire women to work on garments for the soldiers, and uh, that's where we opened up, Nardis opened up this, uh, this, um, uh, factory was where this particular thing so it was doing right after the war right? yes we had a segregated shop because this was all negroes that uh, was notice number two notice number one was the whites and notice number two was the colored. and of course i was president over the colored women we got a call from the colored shop at nardis and uh, we didn't know what had happened. Mr. James just said that Olivia had pull, uh, told him he was secondary and that some of the girls had knives. And uh, so we went down there and uh, he had gone to Olivia with some complaint against somebody and he was using a lot of bad language and everything, and Olivia had merely said to him, Mr. James, go away. That's all secondary to me. I was fired on that particular job, 
and uh, of course that's when the union stepped in and uh, well, I was fired because uh, for being they say it insubordinate you know because I didn't appreciate what the full woman was doing and I told her so and I was called into the office and this particular manager uh, was named James, I never will forget it, and of course uh, we had a heated argument and uh, he took up the uh, 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 mat on his uh, piece of iron that I guess it must have been something to hold the books down with, and he threw it, you know, on the floor and cursed and I told him, I said, that doesn't excite me just since you don't hit me with it, that's all. Well, it was sort of like walking into a mob scene or something. Everybody was on their feet. Some people were crying. Some people were upset with Mr. James's language. Uh, some of our people were using language. And it was, uh, I guess, right close to being a riot. So anyway, uh, he fired me. But uh, I lost a day. And I was back at work the next day, and uh, I didn't want to go back because I felt like that uh, he would be picking at me, uh, always having trouble. But I can truthfully say, whatever um, Perlstein told him, I had no more trouble out of him, and I was right back in my same position. <laughs> As near as I can remember, uh, my father was foreman of the Compress in Natchitoches, Louisiana. That's where I was born. And um, he had a very nice job. And uh, now this might have some bearing on it because people depended on him. They would come to him for different things that would go wrong and all. And I can remember that they had a terrible explosion when I was quite young there. And uh, we thought for a long time that my father had been injured seriously, but he was trying to get the other men out and all, and um, he wasn't injured at all. But uh, it was something that happened that he had been telling them that it might, this particular thing might would happen because, uh, but they didn't go into it and they kept letting him use this old press. And if you ever know anything about a compress, you know, you press the cotton with this machine, this level. Well, something was wrong with it and he'd been, he'd warned them about it and they didn't do anything about it. And that could have been, because it did stay in my mind, why couldn't they have listened to him and so many men wouldn't have been hurt. Nobody died, but a, quite a few of them. And that might have been the, my first experience of knowing that if you'd had someone to go to, to explain that and take that up with, well, then maybe these men wouldn't have been hurt. So that could have been. I met my husband and let me see. I met him in 26 because we went together a short time and we were married. Mm -hmm. And so was he involved with the union? How he did was, he become involved? He was um, union-minded, but of course at the time that we married, they had to send uh, their little fee. Ethel Randolph was trying to get them organized, and they would have to send, I, I can remember, uh, it was a dollar and a half a month. And uh, if um, Fernal, that was the um, superintendent here at that time, uh, if they found out that these men were sending the money to Chicago to help uh, Randolph 
fight for their, uh, trying to get organized, well, then they'd lose their job. So I was very concerned, and uh, I would tell him, honey, be careful, be careful. And uh, because at that time, they had what they call stool pigeons. That's, um, oh, I don't know, we, we usually call them... Uh, Uncle Tom's, you know, that would go back to the white man and tell everything, you know. Some porters that couldn't see it, couldn't see the union. And uh, if we could get the wives in to the latest auxiliary, then that would be a stepping stone to get the husbands because naturally the wife could do more with, uh, so that was our way of um, getting uh, into that home is to get the wife into the latest auxiliary. Then, of course, uh, she would talk to her husband and all. And believe it or not, I have um, really, uh, instigated and getting a good many porters. I used to go, my husband was secretary treasurer at the time, and I'd go down to collect the money on paydays for the, their uh, dues. And um, I would always talk the union, you know, and then sometimes that I'd have an audience, you know, mm -hmm. and down at the union station here. And uh, a lot of men have changed their mind about it. And, Come on into the union. You gotta go down. women experienced a kind of second emancipation as the war's intensive labor demands opened up manufacturing jobs. Over 400,000 black women left domestic work for skilled positions. In all, the number of black women working in manufacturing nearly tripled during World War II. J. Bernard Gould opened up this factory to train Negro women on power machines. And uh, when I started to work there, I worked for 35 cents an hour to learn the trade. And a lot of us did that. He really took so many of the colored women out of kitchens and uh, doing domestic work. And uh, when we learned uh, the skill of being a machine operator, then we started making money. We did mostly piece work. And um, of course, you always had these four women that sometimes you'd have trouble with because um, oh, ever, they were human beings too, and they had um, people that they liked better than they did someone else. And of course, doing peace work, well then uh, naturally they would throw the best work to the people that they liked the best, you know. And of course that's where the four women or the president of the local came in because we couldn't have that. You just couldn't do it openly because uh, everybody, you were on a job, you were there to make a living, and uh, everyone was supposed to be treated fairly. Yes, yes, we had no black fuller women. We had uh, black uh, bundle girls that would bring the bundles, and, uh, but um, no, no black full women at all. Me being an officer of the union, I would always, when we had our uh, round table discussions, I would always tell the girls that they would complain about getting so much work back, you know, and uh, I would say, they always remember this, you've got to be better than good. Because, uh, Frankly, you know, a black woman had two strikes against her when she was born in the world. And uh, she's had to really work very hard to, to get anywhere in life. Mama's got to go 
A major advantage for workers was the closed shop in which only union members could work. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union was able to secure one closed shop in Dallas, but only a few more in Texas. In 1947, closed shops were weakened with passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, which allowed states to pass right-to-work laws. Texas enacted right-to-work in 1948. With right-to-work, employees under union contract were not required to join the union. We were very fortunate. We had a closed shop. That's the thing that uh, Texas doesn't want to go for. But you, you just had to belong to the union to work in our shop. And I'll tell you another thing. Um, you were con if you didn't join the union, uh, you know, people that's union-minded and know what the union stands for, they have no respect for a scam. I still don't have any respect for scabs. Mm -mm. And we had um, some union members that um, wouldn't go to meeting. They were scabby. They had, it was in their blood, you know, and uh, they wouldn't go to meetings, but uh, they had, by being a closed shop, they had to help carry the load, uh -huh. which made it very nice. I'm all in for closed shops. Mm -hmm. There's some of the manufacturers here now. They have uh, shop, uh, opened up factories down in, well, in McK uh, McKinney and different little places because they get cheap labor. To avoid closed shops and to secure cheaper labor, Garment industrialists moved to the border where high unemployment and an availability of workers from Mexico frustrated union efforts. I mean, the wages here in Laredo are rather low. I think we're the lowest paid in the state, or in the nation, rather. I mean, th this is a place where actually we've heard that uh, people that are bringing work here are told not to pay so much because here the, the wages are so much not to pay high because it will ruin the people. My mother used to be a seamstress and I had learned some from her so I applied at this factory and I got a job right away. There's when I started getting interested in, not actually in the work of sewing, but uh, what was going on in there. <laughs> and uh, I started working, I believe when I started working, I started working at 40 cents an hour. And I started looking for information uh, how the uh, wage an hour was, and how the wage an hour would figure that, and. I got it information that they were to be paid uh, whatever they made more, either by time or peace basis. And then I realized that the people were getting robbed of their work because they were working 50, 55 hours and they were being paid for only 18 or 20 hours. I started talking to the people and, and then I, g I got to doing something about it, so I called the wage and hour people. And they came and uh, we were notified that they were, the company notified us that uh, there was a wage and hour people and they told us not to say that we were not punching all the time. And uh, I told the supervisor, why aren't we supposed to say? Because, uh, I mean, if we call them, to come and f figure this out. Why shouldn't we tell them? We, c we call them so that they would know. And she got mad at me and she was all nervous and she went to the hospital. And then they were blaming me because I had made her sick. A suit was filed against the company and we were taken to court to fight that suit and we won that case. But they gave us the decision, was given that uh, the company was fined $19 for each count only. And they were found 19 counts wrong. 
And I wasn't satisfied. The girls were not satisfied. Because he was going to be fined only $19 for each count, and he had robbed money from the people that was for years. So we didn't think it was fair, so we went to court again, <laughs> fought it again, and we won again. A cantar un corrido de la mujer mexicana es la raíz de mi raza y por nadita se raja. Ella si es poderosa le da la fuerza al hogar, le entra bien duro al trabajo porque le importa su raza. The majority of the people that was working in the plant were coming in from Mexico as commuters. And uh, I heard and I knew that there were some people coming asking for work and they would offer themselves working more hours and getting paid less. So we started checking on these people that were working after working hours and they weren't being paid for that time. So we wanted to help them and stop that. We were not trying to get their jobs away. We wanted to get them to work the hours that they punched. And uh, finally we put a stop to their working late, giving hours free to, get, to assure their work, <laughs> their job. That's what they thought they were doing. The language uh, with the union, the language barrier with the workers or the members was that we had a, our managers were always English speaking and we had a hard time communicating and I always had to be interpreting for them. Of course I was an officer, <laughs> I was obligated to do it. But you know how things uh, change in the translation, they don't have the same uh, juice. <laughs> And uh, even if, when we went to district meetings, we'd take uh, Spanish-speaking people in our group. And I would... From Laredo. From Laredo. And, uh, of course, the meetings were in English all the time. But I, will, oh, I was always there with my group, getting in through here and out through here, <laughs> getting it in English through here and out in Spanish. Unions organizing women workers in Texas were not free of race and sex discrimination. The leadership of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union was male. Until the 1950s, black women were segregated into their own locals, and little effort was made to overcome the language barriers with Spanish-speaking members. Well, uh, I've been with the uh, AFL-CIO a whole... Well, for many years, I went to the AFL-CIO meetings and uh, we had a strong uh, Mexicanos and Americanos uh, <laughs> work together and uh, there were times that they were against each other. <laughs> we always thought that the Anglos would always get the better jobs and better positions. We still do. <laughs> it's still our position. In 1967, I left Laredo. I had to leave town, so I quit working there. And God forbid, they said, this is our golden opportunity. <laughs> we got rid of her. Anyway, I went to San Antonio. And uh, I, anyway, I didn't like it there. I came back again. I knew I couldn't get a job back there. I knew it. So I didn't work for about a year. And then uh, a factory opened in Laredo. Uh, we all went to apply there. But you know, everybody get, f get hired except me. <laughs> and they applied after I did. <laughs> so what do you attribute that to? My uh, organizing. They knew I was a union leader. Later, a few months back, later, I, uh, they opened this Levi Strauss. And... Uh, I told the manager here that I was going to apply there and see how it worked. And he says, go right ahead. I mean, that's your decision. 
So I went and applied, and sure enough, I got the job too as an instructor. And uh, I went to work there, and we got instructed that uh, that was non-union and that we couldn't talk union and all that. So I knew I was with management. I was on the other side. <laughs> I worked six months there, but I couldn't take it because uh, I had all for 20 years I worked with the people for the people, and there I was working on the other side. So I told him, quits. Well, it's sad you. Here in Laredo, unions haven't been strong. They, uh, I don't know why, but uh, there's, there's always a fear that if they fire you because you are active with unions, uh, you're black marked and you go look for another place, you, you don't get a job, it happened to me. Uh, and uh, that's one reason. And another is that uh, people are not uh, very involved in organization. Employers, uh, when you go in, they tell you right away, this is not a union place. And we don't want unions here. And if there's no union, I mean, the boss would say, this is it, and that's it. You have no argue. You're there alone. I mean, uh, union, it's togetherness. And if you go, if you want something done, if you go alone, would they, they wouldn't even listen to you. But if you go as a group, I think, uh, as uh, representing the whole body, I think they will hear. But we have in this day and time, now I know my daughter has this problem on the job that she's on because she's a steward and um, she has to talk to the new girls that come into the shop and some of them are very bitter. They haven't heard anything nice about the a union. They've just heard the the big bosses and things like that, but uh, that isn't true. And of course, they have problems now trying to get some of the girls, and they feel like, well, I'm not fattening frogs for snakes. That's the word that they use, you know. And uh, but when as soon as they get in trouble, they'll find her to see if she can help them out. They don't want the working man to organize because they feel like that uh, uh, the labor unions are bad, but for the working and a poor man, that's the answer. Uh -huh. And I've experienced that. At my age, I know that it's, it's the answer to a poor man. Even after we got a union agreement in Dallas, uh, which was not with Larch. We never did get one with Larch. But every time something would go wrong in the Larch shop, they would call our office and say, uh, such and such happened in the shop today. We got our prices cut, uh, whatever the beef was. They knew that we would immediately respond with a leaflet. And they knew immediately that Larch would straighten out whatever the complaint was, and they still would not join the union. They used us. They, they are, they're still using people. After we got a union shop, if the union shops got an increase, Larch and McCarty and Donovan would give the same increase. Sometimes they'd give a couple of cents more. Uh, but, but you would get so angry because you'd get a call and you'd know when you went that you were going to get them the benefits they wanted and that they still were not going to come in and join the union. But you still had to keep trying. Yes, I think we learned a whole lot. I think we learned how to even defend ourselves more. I think we forgot a little bit of the fear that we had. Because 
before we couldn't say nothing, we couldn't talk, period. Afterwards, it was entirely different. And this part about uh, Mexican woman never being involved, that's far from the truth, very far from the truth. Because even from the very beginning, even from the war in Mexico, women were involved in that war. Okay, maybe we have become, or maybe we were, in a sort of uh, apathy because of our ignorance, but uh, we have always been involved in one sort, of, in some sort of ways, whether it's labor, whether it's defending our families, whichever way. We learned that through organization, we could do something. Maybe we didn't win that much as far as mm, money-wise is concerned, okay? But we learned that being united is power. Regardless, it is power. Uh, a single person cannot do anything. Alone, we cannot do anything. People are power. If you have any inquiries about the documentary, Talking Union, here is an address and a phone number. And now for more up-to-date information on union struggles in Texas, here's an interview from August of 1982. Well, now that we've seen the movie Talking Union, all of it, we're going to talk with a person who's involved in union struggles today, Patricia Silva is an organizer for District 65 of the United Auto Workers and Regional Vice President of National Organization of Legal Services Workers here in Texas. Tell us, uh, as an organizer, you see all kinds of situations, all kinds of workers, although I guess you specifically try to organize certain type of workers, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What are the working conditions for women here in Texas like compared to what we saw in the movie? Well, I don't think that they've really changed that much for women that have to work in those kinds of situations, like in a plant. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I have a drive going right now in South Texas with these women that work in an electronics plant, and their conditions are pretty bad. They get paid about they get paid minimum wage and they get a nickel increase an hour after a year. They get oh. three days vacation after a year if they came in before May. They also, um, they don't get paid overtime and they don't get any paid sick leave, any paid vacation, any paid holidays. They get one day for Christmas and that's it. And, um, and so the conditions are still pretty bad. What about the people themselves? Are they single women? Are they single parents? Are they sole supporter of households? Or are they type of, of, in a situation where they have to have their income in order to make ends meet to go along with that income of their husband? Yeah, it is a situation where they have to have that income and that's the reason that they stay, stay there and they try to keep their jobs because a lot of the women that are moving into these kinds of plants, especially down in South Texas where a lot of industries moving now, uh, a lot of these women are former farm worker women and their families were farm workers and the whole family used to work in the fields and now um, there isn't that much employment down there for men but there's a lot of employment for women in these kinds of plants. Pat, what gains have been made for women through organizing efforts in the union movement in the years since the talking union saga? Can you tell some of the advances for women in recent years? Well, I think that a lot, that women have suffered a lot of setbacks, like nationally we can see like their failure to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment really set back women a lot. So that I think that unions can only help women because the only way you can enforce whatever rights you have or can make any gains in your workplace or anything like that at all is through unions since the laws aren't there to pr protect you but if you can get it in a contract you have some kind of protection. There have been a lot more organizing of union hasn't there in the recent years. Can you tell some of the industries where women are playing a significant role in the union movement that you've seen? Well I think um, well, a lot of women, I think that I couldn't say particularly one industry or anything like that, but I think that women are entering the workforce as never before. I think like it's something like 52% of all women are working today. And that there's a lot of shift of organizing women in, in white collar, you know, a lot of places. Um, secretaries are organizing like never before. Um, a lot of what we see in the economy today, the shift towards technology, uh, uh, really rapidly a lot of that work is being done by women and there's in education um, women are organizing and are the leadership of organizing drives in education and secretarial work. This is new is it not that women are playing a leadership role within the union movement. Has this been a significant advance for women that they're actually leading some of these organizing movements and unions? Yeah I think it is um, significant. I think that they're coming into the leadership. I, I believe that women have always been like real active in organizing drives. They've always wanted to organize, they've always displayed that, but they never were allowed to go in, to be in the leadership to actually, you know, be heads of unions or of divisions or, you know, of organizing campaigns. And I think you see that a lot more because of the kind of organizing there is and also because finally there was some realization that they could do it and they were capable of, of doing it. Patricia, in this very anti-union state, and there's a lot of anti-union uh, sentiment in Texas also, what type of reception do you get when you go into these businesses and offices to try to organize? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that there's a difference between being anti-union and being an anti-worker state. And I think that what Texas is, it's, that it's an anti-worker state and that the what what workers have or what people have when you try to organize them is that they're terrified of their employers and they have good reason to be. <laughs> and so that makes a, a lot mm. of difference, right? And I think that it's really hard to organize, but I think people really, basically they're open to a union, especially right now a lot of people, um, you know, your future's uncertain, you've been in a place 10 years and all of a sudden they just decide they want to fire you because they found somebody somebody else or there's a lot of people that need jobs and so employers don't think that they have to keep you working or anything like that if they find somebody they think can do the job better or for any other reason or if you make any kind of trouble. Um, so I think that in that sense people are pretty receptive you know uh, what it is is a, a lot of it's real new to them a lot of people have never been really touched by unions I think in Texas that that's really true that there aren't a lot of places that um, that there are certain sections of people in Texas that are organized 
and the building trades and a lot you know uh, people like that and some auto workers and stuff like that but I think that the majority of people are haven't really been affected by unions don't know a lot of the history of unions and so it's totally new to them and they always proceed from what their employers tell them from what they hear on television or they learn in school but after you talk to them for a while the things that they want you know basically are not what unions are fought are not against what unions are fighting for it's just that it's really hard the laws are very hard to work with and the employers are real vicious and that's what makes it tough over the past oh, four years since we've been doing this program I've been reading a lot of the press left-wing press white wing press the business press over and over and over when there is labor news and there is something involving women's issues the labor unions and the men in the labor unions and even the men in the leadership of the labor unions will be right there at the forefront to either fight job harassment or in support of the ERA or some type of women's, uh, women's issues. Is this because they're more enlightened now or is this a reflection of the greater power that women have in the unions now that they are going into the workforce mm -hmm. so greatly? Well, I like to say that it's a little of both. Um, I think that a certain, the fact that women are a certain economic force has really forced a lot of male leaders to rethink their positions right on women. But I'll, I also think that women as a force, everybody recognizes the fact that a lot of the candidates that are you know, running for office, they recognize the fact that they can't ignore women and that they are really a force. And you see this is a growing thing in the country. Oh, I definitely do. I think women, especially I think in Texas, women, um, minority women in the Southwest and are really going to play a real important role in, in unions. And you're right at the forefront. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you for being with us, Patricia. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm a working woman. They call me nine to five. What that means is I work full time trying to survive. First I take care of boss's business and then I go home and take care of mine. Oh, Yes, sir, have a good day. On my seat, on my seat. Deadline did not delay. I got phone I just in spite of us to put in an extra line. Got to file faster, type faster. Why not? It's clogging my mind. And without me, the boss would be totally at a loss. I'd like some respect to be reflected in the check. And time your girl and you know it at home I'm a woman and I'm a poet I'm skilled at my job so don't abuse it there's power in numbers and working women are gonna use it And that's it for Alternative Views for this evening. Please join us next week. We would particularly like to thank our cameraman, Eric Eubanks, and particularly to Melissa Heald and Jim Cullers for arranging for us to have the documentary talking. Good night. <laughs>